The craziest NFL offseason continues. Justin Fields traded to the Steelers. Now they have two bad quarterbacks. Keenan Allen traded to the Bears and tons and tons of movement in the NFL offseason. We're going to try to figure out what does all this mean? How can we put it to use in drafts? And maybe where are some of the edges that exist with the market reacting so crazily to everything that's happening in the NFL offseason? How can we take advantage of it? That's what we're going to do right now. It's Mike Lee. Rob, I tried right. to have a uh, Saturday night in with the wife. Mm. We're going to cook some dinner, hang out. We actually haven't, uh, you know, I'm a big F1 fan. We actually haven't watched the new season of Drive to Survive yet. We've been kind of delaying it as much as possible for like a night in like that. We were going to kind of do some some Netflix binging. And the, immediately when we're like getting ready to settle in, the Justin Fields trade news drops and you know me then i'm i'm overthinking everything and analyzing this and figuring out where do we rank justin fields what does this mean blah 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 blah. and then the next like two hours of my life are gone on a saturday evening thinking about justin freaking fields and the pittsburgh steelers and the chicago bears but i think it's a summation of this is legitimately the craziest nfl offseason we haven't even had the draft yet the craziest NFL offseason, like from a fantasy perspective, I'm sure there right. have been some chaotic uh, offseasons before. You know, I mean, Aaron Rodgers has moved teams and Peyton Manning has moved teams and all that kind of stuff. But like for fantasy, dude, so many running backs that we've been drafting very highly for years and years and years. Like running backs that have been good. Maybe we have a draft that I'm highly have been good are changing team like. How many years in a row we've been drafted, right? Joe Mixon's on the Bengals. He's a second or third round pick, right? And Dalvin Cook's not a thing anymore, but right. It was like Mixon, Dalvin, Derrick Henry, Austin Eckler. And I'm forgetting names. All these guys that we've been drafting very highly. And then even like some of these wide receivers, right? Keenan Allen's on a new team. Hollywood Brown's on a new team. It's like all of this. And then the quarterback thing, like this is the craziest quarterback off season too. Not from a star power perspective necessarily, but like, we don't even know who's starting for some of these teams. We don't know if Justin, we assume Russell Wilson's starting, but we don't know if it's Justin Fields or Russell Wilson, right? Is JJ McCarthy going to be a starting quarterback? I legitimately cannot remember an off season that was this chaotic for figuring out like where to rank players. What is, what do all these movements mean and all that kind of stuff. So I, that's awesome. And, and a ton of fun, but it's, it's a lot like the last few years have just been like, Okay, I guess I'm fading Derrick Henry again. Hope I don't have to get, you know, buried by 25 Derrick Henry touchdowns. And this year it's like it's a whole new game to figure out. Yeah, I mean, I at first when the Justin Fields news broke, I was like, shit, I should have been a lot more pre proactive in selling my Justin Fields signed helmet that I've been <laughs> sitting here getting trying to wanting to get rid of and just procrastinating and now I don't know what I'm going to get for it. But yeah, it's been a crazy offseason. A couple of years ago, the AJ Brown season when all the wide receivers were moving felt really impactful from mm -hmm. a fantasy perspective. But to your point, there's just so much going on right now. I mean, like even names that we would have like joked about in the past or brought up like offhand, we're forgetting about. Did you remember that Jimmy Garoppolo signed with the Rams? <laughs> three days ago like i mean who even remembers that at this point <laughs> it was three days ago so yeah it's it's been an insane off season i'm looking forward to the draft the running back thing is still the most impactful in terms of there aren't guys coming out of this draft that we really want in my opinion there's there's like you want to take shots but it's not like you want to go nuts drafting these yeah. rookies especially until you figure out where they're landing so I don't know, man. That's why it's so weird because I personally think the draft class is weak overall, although strong from a wide receiver perspective, right? The quarterbacks, the running backs, I think personally are weak. And tight ends so, terrible. That's tight ends one. awful. And so you're looking at you have to 
be mindful of these free agent signings and where they're going. We thought we were going to be done with these running backs, right? Like in our mind last year, last off season, when we weren't really scouting ahead, we were like, Oh, we're finally going to be done with the Joe Mixon, Derek Henry, Alvin Kamara, you know, that tier Aaron Jones, like that group of running backs. But it's like, no, I think you're actually going to have to rely on them at least one more year before you're actually done with them. And that's why I made the point that the second year running backs are going to be vital this year into your fantasy teams. And I think they're going to be like league winners and tournament winners. Um, some of them are overly expensive. I should have never talked about Bijan Robinson. He's already up to like the 105, I think. He passed Brees real fast. <laughs> real quick. So, I mean, there, there's that stuff too. But I think Jameer Gibbs, even though he's like in a tough range to draft, I'm still going to want to draft him as well. And that's what I'm mindful of with this free agency and this offseason and all these moves we're talking about is I actually have to pay attention because we have to use them. We have to draft these guys. Yeah, I think um, I had a conversation yesterday uh, on Sirius with Christy Metzger where we talked about a lot of this NFL news and we talked about a lot of the running backs, the Joe Mixons, the Derrick Henrys and all that kind of stuff. And they have been for the last several years and it's it's been even though some of them have been fine for fantasy from a structural and like strategic perspective, it's really been a home run fading that like cohort of players you don't you don't hit you know the full fade on all of them doesn't work out perfect all the time like say you know i don't know what derrick henry last year or Najee harris in the second round a couple of years ago fading that type of player does you know it, you're never gonna bat a thousand but it's been generally like really good and of course leaning into then you know like zero rb or zero rb principles whether that's like a hero in, in, you can you know use zero rb principles in running back starts and even like running back running back starts but using the kind of structural edges that I think that we've had and just like understanding player types and all that kind of stuff, aging running backs and has been really a, a huge edge. And we talked about like that group of players, like you said, now is, is a little more awkward because um, we pretty much knew what their ceiling was before. And we definitely knew what the floor was, was very low, you know, with a, a guy like a Joe Mixon. And now it's like, he goes to the Texans who were excited about, I'm not excited about Joe Mixon himself in a vacuum. Right. Right. He's going to shoot up boards of course, but I don't know that he's ever going to get so expensive. I, I could be totally wrong about this, you know, and the, the market will, will dunk on me for this take, but I don't know that he's ever going to get so expensive that he's just like, Oh my God, LOL people drafting Joe Mixon. Where is and that? So th that's a question. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good question that I haven't totally wrapped, wrapped my head around. I mean, I'm definitely not taking Joe Mixon in the top, few rounds um but if we if we get if we get into you know, remember last year there was a range of i didn't draft etn but etn Brees, even aaron jones himself like the where what used to be the dead zone was backs that were not dead zone backs right. like a Brees hall or whatever i think we may get that uh, uh even a slight discount on mixing you know right now i'm not gauging the market based on what's happening right now because it's like <laughs> it is all over the place you know you get news and then somebody drafts joe mixon in the second round because he signed with the texans and then the market kind of stabilizes right right and over the over the summer we know how the market is with running backs i th i think it's possible that some of these guys settle into more of the not not exact price, but like the James Conner thing, the Rashad White of last year, where it's like the projectable volume guys initially start too high. And then all of the, you know, underdog drafters, as we do, fade that archetype of a player. And then they fall to a spot where they can be league winners like Rashad mm -hmm. White was, like James Conner can be, like the, like like Najee Harris at, at that point. Right? If Najee Harris is a seventh or an eighth round pick, he can be a great pick, but he's not so good in the third round. I think that's the kind of balancing act that I, I just want them to go, not even in a round or even necessarily at an ADP, but after, after the quarterbacks that I really, like after the superstar quarterbacks, after the superstar tight ends, after a certain level of wide receiver, where I don't I don't want to be giving up, you know, the mega upside bet wide receivers or the elite quarterbacks to get these projectable volume guys. But they have, you know, that they have a, a use case. There is a reason to draft them and they have a place on teams, whereas before it was like all those guys go in the second or third round. 
I'm not drafting them there. And the market isn't like that anymore. So that's another like the market has changed and is still changing a lot, like, you know, especially over the course of the last couple of years. And the whole player pool, like we put all, we put like 30 running backs and and 10 quarterbacks and all this stuff into a blender. We shook them up and we spat them out onto new teams. Mm -hmm. And it's like with the market changing and all this stuff about the players changing, it really does make it, it it's it's a lot harder to figure out where the exploitable edges are whereas i think the last couple of years not saying you know we nailed all those edges but it was kind of like a little bit straightforward you could just walk into the new year and be like who is my 10th round running back that is that i can i can just take a bunch of these 10th round running backs avoid joe mixon in the second round and you know i'm going to be in a good good position in best ball tournaments it's not really the case anymore yeah and there's this whole range in the draft where it's just quarterbacks and running backs that you see litter your board, right? I, I forget right where that is. I, uh, we'll see it in a second when we start drafting. The other thing you brought up was you said after the superstar tight ends. And we were talking about this a little bit on the Sunday stream yesterday. And we have to put together like almost like a tight end round table, get a couple of our friends that are in the industry. And we need to, because I think this is the thing this year. Like everyone's, I know there's other things that people are looking at in terms of drafting and it's whatever, but the market difference of tight ends this year is something that I just notice in every single draft I'm in. And it's altered my draft plans from, I don't want to say from a, I guess technically from a structural perspective where I used to like to punt tight end. Right. Like, mm -hmm. so like that was just my thing last year was just I'm punting tight end. I'll get Sam Laporte late. I'll get all these guys late. Yep. You know, I know they rose up towards the end, but you remember when we were getting Laporta right at the end of drafts and everything. And that's not the case. It's like, do you want to punt tight end? Well, you get Jawan Johnson. Congratulations. That's who you have. You have Jawan Johnson, Noah Fant, and I don't know, Zach Ertz on the commanders now. If you want Zach yep. Ertz, who's John seven years old. Yeah. <laughs> So you got to you got to alter that structure sort of like we had to alter that running back dead zone structure. And what does that mean towards drafting a guy like Mixon, right? So like every domino that falls interacts with the other one in some aspects. So when that running back dead zone differs and then the tight ends are differing and I think it's just the marketplace getting better year after year understanding which players are better for fantasy in terms of we're going to miss of course like you said we're not if we could shoot 100 percent, nobody would play because everyone would just draft the same team over and over <laughs> and over again right yeah. and then we'd all win so i think i think that's going to be one of those discussions that we have along with these running backs along with every position and if that's the case i know we like zero rb i know we like hero rb i know we like all these different types of teams but is there a new structure to build in 2024, right? Like, is there something mm -hmm. that we're overlooking? And I'm not saying there is or isn't. I'm just saying, is there something we should be looking to alter and create like a new approach to how we want to draft our teams and come up with that new, like, I know it's like a catchword, but like a new structure for a team somewhat here and there. And I know zero RB is not done enough still, and yep. all that, and we can we're gonna continue drafting those. But in my mind, I feel like we're missing something mm -hmm. this year. I feel like we're missing something. And as I draft, I'm kind of studying to see if there's a way to exploit whatever it is that we're missing. So, I I I, I love I love that take. Uh, I've been thinking a little bit about that, and we probably won't dig into it today. But I think we're still so the cheesy uh, uh cliche we're still so it's it's still so early still so but we are early. still so early in the whole best ball kind of landscape where because we have like uncovered some of these structural things like you said that we kind of understand how right how, what hero rb is and why it works what zero rb is and why it works blah 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 we feel like we have it figured out like these are the structures you draft. That is it, right? This is how you draft teams. You draft, you know, X amount of running backs by this point, X amount of wide receiver, right? And we we have we think we have it all figured out. The reality is we absolutely do not. We're I th we're much more directionally accurate than we were three years ago. But like mm -hmm. to pretend like we figured this game out is just complete ignorance. 
uh, like I, I, God knows I don't, I don't have it figured out. I have things that I, I prefer, you know, some, some guidelines that I prefer to, to draft by, but that's just personal preference. I think that when, with everything we talked about, you know, for the first 10 minutes about how much the market has changed and how much like the player pool has changed in terms of, obviously we have an influx of new players, but teams, uh, uh, players rotating teams, it opens the door for us. And I think that's what I really want to hone in on. Not necessarily like we don't have to create some crazy new structure, right? We don't have to find the next zero RB that nobody has done before. But I do think there's, we can maybe attack some edges or find some potential ed edges in just thinking about what could we do a little bit differently, right? Like people tried that last year with like the the whole like late round tight end thing. And we like disagreed with that, but I, I, but I appreciated and respected the way they went about attacking it. Right. You just said like the late round tight end was a thing. There was a reason and a rationale to like, I'm just yeah. going to take four. My last four picks are going to be tight ends. I understand why, why people did it. And I appreciate the, the kind of going through that thought experiment and the analysis to find like, no one's doing this. And there's a there's a path to this thing winning. I think when the to when the game completely changes, right? We basically like change the rules of this whole game with this offseason. It opens the door for some new ways of thinking about the game as well. Uh, especially because it does feel a little bit to like me uh, to me like we're we're settling into like this. It's like year year two or three of DFS where it was like everybody we were all horrible in year one maybe not maybe a little bit so much in uh, a little bit still in year two and then like in year three we're like no we got it man you know you just stack your you know, stack a wide receiver with your quarterback play a wide receiver on the other side right play the best running backs and play your defense with your running back that was a big thing back in yeah. the day too yeah. right and it was like we got it all figured out you know we got it everybody built their teams the same and then you start to realize soon thereafter it's like well everybody's doing that there's probably other things that we should do to take advantage because now everybody is doing you know and so i think we're starting to slowly trickle into that thing right big thing that we're starting to see i i've been living a little bit under a rock it's college basketball time for me obviously see north carolina going on uh, uh here i haven't been consuming a lot of content in our space apparently people are are, are uh, figuring out now that drafting guys who don't get drafted in every draft uh in the end is at the end of, of drafts is a is a big and important thing uh i'm hearing that that's that's a, a new a new thing new meta i guess is what they're saying going on going on around around best ball which is kind of humorous because i mean we've 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 been talking about that for for a long time. That's probably why folks like like Updog and and Dorito or shipping uh, shipping tournaments and Spike Weekers are winning tournaments all over the place because we're uh, doing a good job of identifying those things ahead of time. But I think that there's there's going to be some other things to your point, like structural things, new drafting strategies that haven't been uncovered yet. Like people have, like if, if people weren't figuring out like that. Uh, 20% owned Kyron Williams was better than 100% owned Deuce Vaughn. Like I got, I got news for you. You, you, you you're behind the eight ball here in this game that <laughs> that, that that we're playing. Um, but I think that there's more to uncover. Um, quickly, uh, I do want to hop to our draft here in just a second, and we'll continue to talk about kind of this this off season and all that kind of stuff first. Uh, if it's your first show, thank you for joining us. If it's not, just a friendly reminder. We'll try to answer any and all questions here at this beginning section. We'll riff a little bit on whatever is top of mind, and then we'll try to answer your questions. If you would like to get a question answered live on the show, there's a link to the Discord in the description. In the Discord, it's 100% free. Pop in the live streams and media channel and post your questions the day of either when Mondays or Wednesdays when we have our live streams. Uh, if you want to do it for Rob, too, on, on his Sunday morning streams, by all means. And uh, we'll try to answer those questions or as many of those questions as we can. We do have one, and it's a good one. That we'll get to in a second but there was a really good question here uh uh from or or comment that i really wanted to hit on with the running back thing mm -hmm. cobra kai says um but who were you taking in round two when we were talking about mixon and derrick henry and all that who are you taking in round two instead of joe mixon if it was jalen waddle you know devonta smith whatever those guys weren't great in round two either and that's a totally fair point but what i would say is this uh uh like kind of line of thinking is specifically why the like zero RB thing works is because people think about it like that. Like, well, if Jalen Waddle wasn't good, I can just take a running back in round two. But when a running back whiffs, 
the trickle down effect to the rest of your roster is so much greater than when a second round wide receiver whiffs Jalen Waddle providing not second round value, but still being okay is so much more valuable to your team from a structural perspective, because he is still out there scoring fantasy, you know, assuming it's not an injury related thing. He's still out there scoring fantasy points and he's still going to score fantasy points at a greater rate than late round wide receivers are right. Sure. If you find Puka, of course I get it right. That's, 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 it's easy to say, but there's, there's like the wide receiver thing is so much more powerful. The misses are smaller misses generally speaking on the early round wide receivers than they are on the early round running backs. And it's not just because they miss it's because we know inherently every single season mid to late round running backs are going to hit. We may not know who it is and we, it may not be to the level of Kyron Williams, but running backs get hurt and running back is an opportunity driven. It's of course talent driven, but it is opportunity driven by nature. And so when the running back whiffs, in your as your second round pick, you now have a whiff at running back and less wide receiver firepower. And your opponents have found the running back firepower at a cheaper price, and they have more wide receiver firepower than you. So it's like a double whammy type of a situation. And that's why it's not wrong to take early round running backs, but why you have to be really smart about it and why we talk about the structural shit all the time. It's like you can't just rip a bunch of running backs at the beginning of the draft because the, the impacts are not just about that player in a vacuum, whether they hit or miss. The impacts are this crazy trickle down effect to your entire roster. And it's most prevalent at the wide receiver or uh, excuse me, at the running back position, because if they whiff, like you are losing so many points to your opponents. And in particular in best ball, you're losing so much firepower in week 17, you know, week 15, 16, 17, where dude, there's just going to be mid to late round running backs popping off in those weeks. It's just like, it, it's just a fact. It happens every single year, right? I don't know who it's going to be, but they're going to come through because running backs are going to get hurt, right? Running backs that we think are in timeshares emerge, right? Raheem Mostert comes out of nowhere or Kyron Williams goes out, comes out of nowhere. God forbid B. John Robinson goes down. Guess who you would like to have on your team? Tyler Algier, right? That stuff happens every, yeah, that stuff happens every single year. And so um, it was a, it was a totally valid point and question, but that's like why the whole running back first wide receiver thing. It, I don't think that part of it gets talked about enough is because of it is the structure thing, but it's like really, really powerful. Yeah. And you, brought up the outliers right like you brought up um puka i saw in the chat someone brought up tyler higby as the late round tight end like that busted last year and we can bring up late round tight ends last year that busted and didn't bust it's it all ties together which is the funny thing right because when you're talking about outliers when we talk about grabbing more volume on these guys that aren't getting drafted which like as you said is becoming the buzzword it's because you're looking for those outliers to correspond with the right type of team. You're looking for the Chiron to go with your Jalen Waddle, who you also had, I don't know, I I shudder to say it, but you had Adam Thielen who carried you yep. instead of Jalen Waddle if you decided to go that route, right? Which a lot of us didn't. A lot of us probably should have done more Adam Thielen last year. I'm still not doing him this year. Like nope. I'm not, I'm not doing, I mean, that's, it's a whole different I'd can of worms. Lose. <laughs> again this year, again yeah. <laughs> so i mean like there's that stuff so yeah we could we could talk about that all day but i i agree and we also have to say since we're talking about outliers almost the entire second round busted last year which is yeah, so what are you gonna do not draft them <laughs> a crazy outlier right like it, as a whole the second round was an outlier last year so i i think we got a and that's why we just got to like look year over year instead of trying to compile data all the time on every single season because outliers are going to come from everywhere. There's going to be a year that the week 17 and 18, I mean, I'm sorry, round 17 and 18 guys do nothing for you. Like yeah. someone's not going to pop one year. It's just, it's going to be one of the outlier years, right? You're not going to yep. get Kyron and Puka every year. It's going to be um, Eric Gray. <laughs> most of the time right mm -hmm. yep. not to take a shot but just like in yeah, terms the of fuck? the thought process was right though like the, the thought process on eric gray was right is the point 
It doesn't mean that you're going to be right every time, but it's the thought process. It's not doing level one thinking. You're playing poker with somebody, right? And they're like, see, this is why I never play ace king. Or this is why I should have played six, eight offsuit from middle position, right? <laughs> like to a raise. It's like you're looking at the results afterwards. You're looking at the card run out. You're not. Now let's give you that six, eight. Let's run the deck 10 times. Let's run 10 seasons of best ball. Guess what? That deck's different every single time. The cards got dealt out different every single time. The rounds of players are different every single time. Positional allocation is different every single year. So you have to understand that you're RNGing it a little bit. And how do you attack RNGs and you play your best spots? That's why Ace King wins more money than every other hand. That's why Aces win more money than every other hand. Still lose, but that's why you know how to play your cards from whatever position you're dealt them a hundred percent um quickly i want to hit this uh good question very good question from arctic spurs in the discord he says uh with rookies getting steamed up how do you feel about snagging falling veterans at a value does it pay to zig when everyone else is is zagging i'll pass it to to you first because you've kind of already hit on on this a little bit and uh, we we generally agree but uh, what do you think about kind of, uh, you know, rookies? And and I, I, I'll toss in just to add some more context to him. Even mm -hmm. it could be like rising veterans as well, right? But the steamy players right now in the big board and like finding a pivot to them. What do you think about that? Well, God, it's, it's a great question. It's a very broad question too in terms because like it's, sometimes it's player dependent, but sometimes it's not, you know what I mean? Like, so mm -hmm. I guess the way I would approach it is who do you think is the value at the moment, right? In terms of the rookies, are some of these rookies values that you think that you can be grabbing at that point? Are they getting overlooked, right? Is Malachi Corley, is he getting overlooked to you? You know, I just say that name because I really like that name. That's a, yeah, it's a, it's a great established. Name. He has a fucking badass <laughs> name. So if he's getting overlooked to you, then yeah, just be drafting him whenever you can um, at a reasonable rate. But if it's a rookie that's getting steamed up that you're just not in on, don't chase the steam. And you can say this with veterans too. Don't chase the steam. Like, so if you're not in on Joe Mixon, do not follow him up the draft boards. You've already lost best value for Joe Mixon. <laughs> um, the, the big one with this right now is Saquon. Saquon's move, and, and this isn't me like, like victory lapping. I'm actually, you, you've been on, you're not drafting Saquon since the beginning. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden I'm hearing everybody else say they're not drafting Saquon. So how in the hell is he rising 12 spots? Or whatever it is. So who is drafting Saquon if nobody's drafting Saquon? And what? Right? And it, if you weren't, if you were drafting him before and he lands on the Eagles, why is now the time you're not? Draft? Where was he going to land that you would have been excited? Right. That's what so, I also don't understand. You know Houston. what I mean? <laughs> Houston was the spot. It, but is Houston that much better? Like, I mean, it's I maybe so. better. I think so. I just in terms of my concern with the Eagles is pass catching out of the backfield. Yeah, but sure. if he scores more. Which which is possible. Um, yeah. I, I'm I'm still drafting Saquon. That's I'm yeah, not I know you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, but I'm not going nuts with him. But I wasn't before either. So like, if you like a rookie over him in that range, like if you like neighbors over Saquon, by all means, draft neighbors over Saquon. Right? Like, I, I think you have to have, I think you have to take stands occasionally and like have have a read on read on the draft room, a read on drafts overall and a read on what you like with some players. And I think if like some of these guys that you're scared of, you know who the perfect example of this is last year for me that I got scared of is Darren Waller. Uh, this is a great one because I was like, there's no way in hell I'm drafting Darren Waller, right? Like I don't <laughs> like Darren Waller. He was going in. He started off the year going mid rounds. I think, I think he was going around like 13, 12. I don't remember, but he was going late. And the steam started. Do you see Daniel Jones? He only has eyes for Darren Waller. <laughs> yeah. This is all he's doing. He's only throwing to Darren Waller. And I they're was do, like, oh, I they're doing care. the Chiefs. They're, they're doing the Chiefs thing. They're not going to sign any wide receivers. And Darren Waller is going to be there. Yeah. Travis Kelsey. And I sat there. And I'm like, I'm not drafting Darren Waller. 
And then I started watching him rise up round 11, round 10, round nine, round eight, round seven. I'm like, oh, I'm like, now I'm getting nervous because of, what am I missing here? And this is what you're going to do in your mind. You're going to do this with certain players in your mind. And then I think I took a share of Darren Waller once in like the fifth round <laughs> because like I started getting nervous. I'm like, I'm getting like everyone else is talking him up. I'm, I feel like I'm the only one that sees Darren Waller for what he is. And then I drafted him like, I hated that. I hated drafting that man. <laughs> like, no disrespect, to Aaron Waller. I mean, but Enjoy R. retirement. R. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, so after that, I was like, I'm just going to keep my stand. Like, if I didn't like him in the 14th round, I, I understand that information can change and you can, but some guys, man, you just got to, you got to draw a line in the sand occasionally. And we're going to call it the Darren Waller line going forward. If this is a game that we're playing against other people with a weird little market based, you know, thing that's going on where we value players at certain, at certain costs. So no matter what our takes are, no matter what we believe about, you know, like you said, you believe something about Darren Waller and then the markets, you, the market drove you to start to question it and you should have held, held firm, but the opposite can also be true. The market, right? So this is what happened for me with, uh, and they were both whiffs. The market end, ended up right, but uh, a Damian Harris and a Rashad Penny or something like that, where I was, I I loved them, and then the market was at totally out on them, and I wasn't out on them, and so both of those things can happen, but we're playing a game in which, right? It, prices change, so people constantly talk about exposures and all that kind of stuff, and it's like. And it, discussing things in any one individual player exposure is really a flawed way to ever think about something. And it's because of exactly what we're talking about here and what Art Spurs is asking about is that we're always trying to find, right? Like you said, what is, what is the value at that time? And what is the exploitable angle at that time? And what right. I would, what I would like, how I generally like to think about it is market confidence, right? Market is either very, very confident that something is happening what well, is is almost always confident in something or there's a little bit of times where they just like throw up their hands and the, and they don't know i think about the bears running backs last year they might end mm -hmm. up happening again again this year but like the bears running backs last year the market was just like herbert roshan foreman i have no idea we're gonna toss them in some order but it's whatever but then other times you get the the market overconfidence i'll take ty j spears for the last two months before they signed Tony Pollard, where it was like, yep, it's Ty J time, baby. Derek is gone. We're, we're going to, you know, we're going to round six, Ty J Spears. He's the man. And nobody ever put any risk in the fact that they would bring somebody in because we are like, and, and it was logical. This is the thing. Yeah. It can be logical and, and, and well thought out, but it doesn't matter because there's, there's this, there's a, a balancing act of, Yes, it's logical. And I agreed. My my take was Tajay Spears is probably going to be the man. They have no reason to go pay a bunch of money for a running back. They're going to stink. They're rebuilding. Why wouldn't they just give it to Tajay? But that doesn't matter because it's a game against other people. And when you see the market is <laughs> completely locked in that, uh, yep, Tajay's the man. We're going to put him up there. Right? Remember when the Broncos got Russ? And the whole goddamn Broncos offense was priced in like the first four rounds yeah. of, of drafts. You know, Albert O became the steamiest tight end when they moved Noah Fant even. And that dude can't even play Legend. in the XFL. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like the market gets really confident in so many of these situations that it's a, they, they know the order of the running backs. They know the order of right. How targets are going to get distributed. They know which offenses are going to be good and which offenses are going to be bad. And in this time of the year, they, they know which running backs are going to get replaced and which ones aren't. And guess what? We're wrong all the fucking time constantly. And it's not because our, we're not smart or we're not being thoughtful about this. I think the Tajay take was fine. I think if people said, yeah, Zamir is going to get right. Zamir White's going to get replaced. Uh, there's just he's not special. He was fine last year, right? They'll either bring Josh Jacobs back or they'll bring somebody in. Guess what? That was logical, and you were wrong. <laughs> they did not bring anyone. You know, they did not. They bring got anyone. Madison coming yeah, in for a workout. Exactly, buddy. <laughs> exactly. Alexander Madison is coming to Las Vegas. So it does like it's it's just a game of that zigging in like. I wouldn't say it's just with steamy rookies, although that I do think that is one thing that you can do when when the market says 
AD Mitchell is the guy, you can say Malachi Corley is the guy and and get a, a steep discount on that, right? Uh, but the the thing also exists in just like just about anything where the market is crazy confident in something. And there's a million things. Like I said, the Broncos are going to be awesome because they got rust now. It's like, well, what if they're not? If you made that bet and you just said, I mean, it's still Jerry Judy and Cortland Sutton and Albert O. Like, what have they ever really done? If you said that, guess what? You, you know, you fade the steam on the Broncos. You printed, dude. You absolutely printed fading those guys. And like, so it's all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, I I made that bet specifically to the, like this question on, uh, you mentioned second year players and like second, it was second year and, and like uh, uncertain running backs. And some of them were whiffs, like, RIP Ty Chandler. They have they you know they got rid of Madison, but guess who's here? A much worse, much worse competition than <laughs> Alexander Madison for Ty Chandler with Aaron with Aaron Jones, right? Some of them are total whiffs. Chase yeah. Brown, oh hooray, Joe Mixon is gone. Oh no, Zach Moss, oh no, Zach Moss is here, right? Hooray, you know, uh uh, uh Aaron Jones is gone and AJ Dillon's gone. Wheels up Emmanuel Wilson. Oh no, uh, uh, uh Jess Jacobs is here and AJ Dillon's back with the Packers. You whiff on some of those. But when you hit, you get Zamir White, right? Or you get Rashad White of last year or many other situations. And so I think that's how I would think about that question is just trying to assess the spots where it's it's not only that the market is overconfident, but there's big wins available to you if you bet against what everyone is just assuming to, to be true. And the last thing I want to hit on this, and we're going to jump in the draft, is – understanding the tournament you're in too so like the one we're about to enter the big board we're going to still draft rookies in this today most likely it'd be hard not to but if you're looking to draft rookies in the big board the time to do it is early you could actually even play i think the big board from a fade the majority of rookies perspective towards the back end of the times time frame of this tournament because they get so steamed up and all these steamed up rookies are going to drop significantly when not all but you know what i mean like a, a majority mm -hmm. of them are going to drop significantly after the draft so you can re if you want to play it that way you can be like well i'm going to draft rookies at the beginning of the big board i'm going to lean off the gas a little bit at the end of big board and i'm going to restart drafting my rookies at the beginning of the best ball mania season so that's yep. another way to look at it as well i as, totally agree as we jump into this draft Let's see where. Let's see how many. Oh, look at this. We're gonna avoid all these sickos in the uh, uh, in the chat, you here. guys. Um, I just want to hit a few of these comments. Um, yeah. So uh, Randall likes Demario Douglas. Cobra Kai likes Demario Douglas. Um, I have no. I, I don't really have a strong take on Demario Douglas. Uh, what I will say is he does have a cool nickname. He goes by Pop. Uh, pop douglas i enjoy i enjoy that nickname also he he looks like a pop he's this tiny little jitterbug of a of a wide receiver but i would caution against now i think it's fine he's cheap right okay. whatever no big no big deal but he is also the kind of a player where if he gets priced up and i think there was a little bit of time where the the market was like you know oh pop's gonna be the man there because they don't have any wide receivers those are the exact kind of situations if the market gets overconfident right to the ty j example just because he's at the top of the depth chart right now does not mean he will be at the top of the depth chart later, certainly in the big board, but even like even over the summer, like crazy stuff happens, man. Like we project think Van Jefferson was supposed to be at the top of the depth chart for the Rams and he wasn't even on the Rams. <laughs> you know, like this stuff happens a couple of years ago, Latavius Murray was supposed to be, you know, like in a timeshare with Alvin Kamara and he got freaking cut, you know, at the, at the end of the season. Uh, and then, kind of sucked out because every Ravens running back got hurt and he was playing for the Ravens later in the year. But like, that's all the chaos that happens. We are wrong. So, so, so often the season happens. We tilt about how wrong we were about so many things. And then the season gets over and we do the same goddamn thing all over again and try to like predict the future. It's like, we're, we're doing the definition of, of, uh, of, uh, uh insanity. insanity. And, and it's like, that's the big thing that I do it too. It's so easy to fall into those traps, but I like, that's the thing I'm trying to continue to reiterate to myself is don't get stuck in your, your takes about every assessment and make sure you're applying them to what your opponents are thinking too. Because if you're just falling in line with what everybody else is thinking, 
You're just going to get the same results as everybody else. And we need to finish at the top. We don't need to finish, you know, at the same as everybody else. Like we don't want the same advance rate as everybody else. We don't want the same teams as everybody else. <clears throat> we want to navigate our way to the top. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that people you respect are people you like, cause there's people that I respect that when I hear a take from them, I'm like, what the, f what are you talking about? And, and I, and then I find out I'm the only one looking at it from a different perspective. And I'm like, maybe I'll just trust my gut on this particular thing. We are on the clock at the one Oh nine right now. We got Puka. We got AJ Brown. We got Jameer Gibbs on board. What are you thinking here? I prefer the wide receivers, but I don't have a, <clears throat> I don't, I, I'm, I generally take Puka, um, at this spot, just I've been taking uh, AJ Brown over Puka, so I'm down to take Puka, yeah, on this team Puka. and and roll from there. But I also I like taking AJ Brown. So that we did this, I think, yesterday on stream. I like taking AJ Brown over Puka because I like having that chance of Kyron falling back to me in the second round, and that's what I started yesterday was AJ Brown. Kyron Williams, so yeah, I think it just it leaves me that extra door. The 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 little running back stuff here is is pretty interesting to me. I haven't wrapped my head around exactly how exactly how I want to handle it, but historically, again, the prices on someone like a Kyron Williams, even a Jonathan Taylor, even a Saquon Barkley, mm -hmm. would be you would not be getting them in the middle. You know, you, we would never have Kyron Williams falling to the middle of the second round after the year he just had, and the fact that. He's just like locked into that same role right. on that same offense that uh, their offensive line got better. <laughs> their offense might get better than it was last year. And he's just locked into that role. Um, but the market is not totally in love with Kyron Williams, uh, which I understand. So it's just uh, the, the I still haven't totally wrapped my head around. Normally, I'm pretty locked in on what mm. I want to do in the first two rounds. And this year just feels pretty peculiar. I do like JT here. Uh, but I'm also open to Nico or Marvin Harrison, or if you want Saquon, it's fine with me too. No, I, I mean let's take Jonathan Taylor. I, I just I, different start. I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm pretty into JT. Uh, a, a similar to um, uh, you mentioned with Saquon, like the one concern with Saquon with the Eagles is like the pass catching thing. Mm -hmm. But like, I think, and my, I agree. But that's the the if you hear people talk about JT. What's the first thing they're gonna they're gonna say about like why isn't he a first round pick? It's like, well, Anthony Richardson doesn't throw to running backs. Yeah. yeah, Anthony, and it's like, yes, he's not going to throw to running backs like Aaron Rodgers does or whatever. But the level of talent that Jonathan Taylor is, <clears throat> the production we got last year, the production we've had for his entire career, and the pass catching thing, a this is underdogs, this is half point PPR. It's not as as big of a deal. We want touchdowns. He's going to score touchdowns. The running quarterback thing, I think, gets a, quite overblown from time from time to time. Now, these guys are going in the first two rounds, so it's probably not super overblown. But I think when people push back on guys like JT, even guys like Saquon, like the whole pass catching thing is like he's going to catch some passes. You know, they're going to design some screens and he's going to catch some passes. He's not going to catch as many passes as Christian McCaffrey or whatever. But like if he's efficient on the ground, do you really like if he runs for 102? So he caught two passes instead of five. Like, right, right. do you really actually care? Um, so it, it matters. It definitely matters. And like, you know, uh, Pat Green has done awesome uh, analysis on you know, the legendary upside for running backs and needing pass catching. But I also think that it's that that's not the whole game. That's not the whole, that's the whole game isn't, I, I'm not sure how many legendary upside running backs we'll ever see again. You know, like the game has changed a little bit. Like there, there aren't like Christian McCaffrey is kind of a unicorn, right? Uh, I don't expect, you know, Brees Hall to catch 12 balls in a game anymore because they're going to be better on offense. They're not going to be checking it down to him on every single goddamn play <laughs> in, in week 16 or whatever it was like last year, but he's going to offset that because he's just going to be so much more efficient with a, a good offense. And so it's that push pull of the running back thing that, uh, but also why, why like zero running back works is I don't have to have that debate on a 12th round running backs. Like dude, just score points. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't need to worry about it quite to the extent of massaging every catch reception or every catch projection that I have on a first round running back. Yeah. I'm just looking through the running backs right now. And 
you brought up you don't know who's even capable and what is there maybe four maybe five guys that are actually capable of that legendary upside season like and that's stretching it a little bit probably Gib- gibbs needs a dmot injury right but otherwise it's the top three it's the top three gibbs and pure run good a chain like yeah same thing if he just becomes right pure dumb, like some- yeah. Somehow Mostert becomes nothing. He flips the Mostert role, but like, again, you know, you talk about pure run good. That would be for a hundred ninety act- pound running back. That would be a pretty epic change. I actually find him his ADP very interesting because of the way you have to play a chain if you draft him up there. To me, you have to play him like he's McCaffrey. Oh, interesting. See, I, I, I think you have to draft him like it's a zero running back team because he is kind of a going to be an all over the place kind of player. You're not just locking in, you know, an RB1 every single week like you are with McCaffrey. Hmm. All right, we got Laporta. We got Waddle. We took JT and Puka. I like, I mean, I like, what I mean, you know me. I like the wide receivers. Um, I, I don't hate Laporta, but it's a little rich for me. Waddle, Neighbors, Devonta Smith, Cup. We could do, we could do Cup and try to double tap the Rams, or we could push mm. Cup and see if he comes back. We'll do Waddle. I was kind of on the fence. I was gonna, I was gonna advocate for Devonta Smith for a few reasons here. Yeah, I'm down uh, for Devonta Smith. That was we ended up going with Waddle. Uh, neighbors would have been fine too. Neighbors is interesting because. He's kind of shot up to the third round, and I think he is definitely a guy that's. Do you think he's going to fall after the draft? Because where's where's he going? He's going early for sure. Yeah, top five. Um, I don't know. You think it's he's tough. going top five? I mean, I thought he was going to go like top eight for sure. But you think I saw something from I forget who it was the other day that projected quarterback, 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 Harrison neighbors in the uh, as oh, the top interesting. five. Um, I'm not, there are people who are much more up on all the mock drafts. I, I, uh, I'm not grinding all the different mock drafts anymore, but, uh, I did see something like that. So here, I mean, I like T quite yeah. a bit. I also like Lamar, but those would be, those would be my guys. I know, uh, I, I can't take Mahomes over Lamar, but it would be T or Lamar for me. Let's go T, uh, just because of the rumor. And I think taking T makes more sense here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And seeing what we can push back to us in the fifth round. Can I, can I call one, one thing, um, Cobra Kai was mentioning like setting up the, the Ram stack. I have no interest in Matthew Stafford. No. Um, I like the Rams a lot and Stafford is a reason why I like the Rams, but I don't want Stafford on my fantasy teams. Uh, I hope, I hope that that makes sense. I think it's what we would call stacking without the quarterback. We've, we, we talked about this a lot last year, not specifically for the Rams, but, but it's huge. The Rams, the jets, uh, quite, I don't want to classify the Falcons quite as much, but they're similar where I don't need the pocket passer, who provides zero on the ground yeah, um, and doesn't really have like, if you go back and look at Matthew Stafford's like game logs, even when he had good games, you just like didn't care about his, his quarterback score and quarterback scoring is so replaceable. We'll definitely have to talk a lot more about this over the summer too, because there's a lot of like quarterback is the position that I don't feel bad about. <laughs> like, like all these other positions, you can get locked out a wide receiver running back is a weird weird uh dynamic this year and like you mentioned tight end after like round eight i want to throw up every time i click <laughs> on on one of those guys but co- so so where can i <clears throat> lean into things to make sure i'm i'm feeling good about the rest of my roster is that quarterback like it's the most replaceable uh position from a scoring perspective and like dude there's a bunch of dudes that go past like round nine round ten that's like all the rookies are there. I do really like Caleb Williams. We should probably talk about Caleb Williams uh, a little bit later with Keenan. In I mean, my God, uh, imagine being the number one overall pick and being dropped into DJ Moore, Keenan Allen, DeAndre Swift, Colt yeah. Komet. Like, what a sick situation for Caleb Williams. But like Trevor Lawrence, Baker Mayfield, uh, 
you know, I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting other guys. If you like Tua again this year, you know, Jared Goff even has more upside than those other guys. And those, he's not a runner, but these other guys just have real upside, particularly the runners that like, like, give me Kyler Murray, man. Like, just give me Kyler Murray. I don't care if I have the other Rams. I, I, I can have multiple stacks without the quarterbacks on my team. And I actually think that that's a big talk about structural edges is, you know, get your Lamar Zay flower stack or Lamar Andrews, and then build out other stacks. You build the Rams, build the jets, build whatever other stacks onto that team, but you don't need those court. You don't have to force those quarterbacks. You can actually end up getting like six stacks on your team. If you don't force the quarterback with them, you know what I mean? You can get the rushing quarterback with one or two of his pass catchers and some Rams and some jets and some Falcons and all that kind of stuff. And you get all of it in one. All right. We are back on the clock here. We see McBride and Mark Andrews at the top of the list. Um, wide receiver, Calvin Ridley in Tennessee. <laughs> Unbelievable deal. Yeah. I like McBride here personally um, for multiple reasons. I, I would like to take McBride. Love him. Get, get him late fifth round. I'll take that all day. Big fan. He's falling back. He's falling back a bit. He he was his price was he was probably the reason to draft the big board in the first couple of days. His mm. his original original price was outside the top 100, and then he skyrocketed up, and he's kind of fallen back uh, a little bit. And I don't really know why. Uh, yeah, he, he, I I don't know why his ADP would move. I guess just like the, nothing changed about him. Just running, you know, Josh Jacobs and Derrick Henry and those guys rose. I guess would be it. Yeah, that's probably it. And anticipation of them drafting a wide receiver. I think people are. Yeah. But Hollywood's that. gone. Like, well, the Hollywood thing is interesting because th that was, I was not, <laughs> how do I put this? I'm a big Rasheed Rice fan. I like Rasheed Rice. Nobody had more Rasheed Rice than me last year. Right. But his, his ADP was disgusting in this tournament to start. And we knew they were always going to bring somebody in. I know it's the Chiefs, and they haven't done it the last few years, but most of their guys were gone. They had to bring someone in. And as soon as Hollywood comes in, what happens to Rasheed Rice? Just starts going down, down, down. So, like, to me, we were talking about this earlier. The easy, One of the easier fades in the early rounds was Rasheed Rice in terms of we knew someone was going to come in and people are going to overreact. I think that's the biggest thing about the big board. Overreactions is, is just – you know, and I'm not saying that Rasheed Rice deserved to be where he did in the first place, but you can count on the overreactions yes. or the or the draft or the drops or any, and stuff like that. So, just just eyeballing those situations is relatively easy in my in my opinion. I got a I got a, a Hollywood and a Rice take, but we'll, we'll make a pick. Okay, so I'm curious what you do here. Chris Godwin's actually my favorite wide receiver, but I also just love these. I love double tapping tight end around here too. Yeah, double tapping tight end seems fun. Do you have a preference? I mean, I bet you can guess. Yeah, I don't I don't hate getting a Falcon on this team. We'll take Kyle Pitts. Falcon on every team. Yeah, that's the goal. That's the rule. That's the rule. You gotta have we're a, team Kirk. Have a we're team. we're team Eddie Bauer around here. Uh Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins, team Eddie Bauer. Um no, I am. I I, uh, I said this yesterday to Christy as well. You can you can bet your ass. I'm not going to lose on the Falcons for two straight years, <laughs> overpaying for this donkey Arthur Smith with Marcus Mariota and Desmond Ritter just being a stubborn idiot, drafting Kyle Pitts and Drake <laughs> London and all these guys. You're not going to catch me overpaying for two years, complaining. For two years, two years of my life that I complained about Arthur Smith and these shitty quarterbacks and, you know, all the people mocking, you know, us Kyle Pitts people and us Falcons people. They were right. I was wrong. But all the people mocking us, you know, about, oh, ha, ha, ha. You thought the Falcons would be good, blah, blah, blah. And then the thing I complained about, we need better quarterback play and we need Arthur Smith to be gone. And they both happen in this offseason. And I'm not going to draft. I'm not going to be heavy on the Falcons. I would rather fucking lose than, than go through a summer when all that came together. And I, and, and I didn't draft the Falcons. Like it, 
my Falcons takes will not be logical. We're going to get that out of the way here in March. So when I say it again in July, when Drake London's going at the 2-3 turn and I tell you to click them, we're just going to get this out of the way. That my Falcons takes will not be logical. I'm betting on them. I'm going to probably bet them to win the division. I like the Falcons. Yeah, I'm not going to disagree. I'm I'm a Falcon in every draft if possible. I did draft Kirk Cousins on stream yesterday, but I think that goes into what we were talking about with team stacks where my plan was never to draft Kirk Cousins. It was just sort of an emergency out more so than anything as a second quarterback. But you shouldn't be you shouldn't be keeping that emergency out in your head because then you're going to do it too many times. It's right. a great point. It's a great point. You can always have that in your back pocket, right? So like right. if we had drafted Cup or whatever, we mm-hmm. have Stafford in our back pocket, but we can still go target the McBride Kyler stack and like whoever, right? Uh Caleb Williams and somebody or draft Jaden Daniels or draft right or draft Trevor Lawrence and Gabe or you know, I'm just throwing shit out there. You can still go after those quarterbacks you prefer and stack them. But if it doesn't go according to plan, oh my God, all the quarterbacks I wanted got sniped away from me. I have Stafford in my back pocket that I can still build a really strong stack team. It's not what I would like to do, but that's actually the huge benefit of it is it just gives you all these outs as you're building out your team. And I think the rule of thumb that I follow on that, and every room is different. So like, you know, draft accordingly would be to always push that quarterback around and never bring him up. Right. Like I, I'm never going to bring Stafford up with the with the double stack because it's already been done enough. So if you're going to try to do it, you got to find a way to get an edge on it. And that's by pushing him one more round. Again, every draft's different. If you get into this like super quarterback happy room. DraftKings. You know, this yeah. is not DraftKings advice. This is not draft, <laughs> not draft Kings is a whole different ball game is what we will say. Uh, so this is that range I was talking about, right? Where. You know, Deontay Johnson looks like he's moved up a little bit, but That's you start getting good. into this range. You have that is that is rich for Deontay. Did did we not watch the Panthers last year or Deontay Johnson last yeah. year? But this is kind of what you see here is it, yeah. it all moves up. Um, I think I'd like to take Kyler. Yeah, I mean, you don't mind. Yep. We're looking at prefer- two players behind I- us without. A QB. I, I was just gonna say I do prefer Dak, but mm-hmm. I think it. Uh, I, let's secure Kyler if we want a double tap quarterback. If Dak falls back to, I, I don't know if Dorito has um, any Cowboys or or anything. He might. He might. He might have. Uh, no, no, he doesn't have a tight end, so he doesn't have Ferguson. I don't think he'll have CD right because we were at the end of the first round. But anyway. I take the quarterback that fits your team the best. And if we want to double tap Dak, he can come back to us. Um, it's kind of how I like to like to play it there. Yeah, agreed. Uh, but yeah, this is that range where it just gets ugly, man. It's there's not a wide receiver in sight. Romeo Dobbs looking for a lifeline over here. Like, how am I the only wide receiver here? And then you get down to Jamison Williams and Jacoby. We should Myers. screenshot the top of this queue. And when someone says, why do you like zero running back? I said, here's, <laughs> here's what the seventh and eighth round looks like. This is why I like zero running back. The best wide receiver is Romeo Dobbs. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we only have three wide receivers. We'll, we'll fill it out, but completely agree. So we see a little tight end run happen here where Manta Ray double taps with Ferguson and Ingram. We, we, uh, the wide receiver avalanche used to be a thing, and we created the tight end <laughs> avalanche. And Dobbs does go. Are you interested in any of these running backs? Do you like Jamison Williams? Yeah, yeah, more? yeah. yeah. I, I, I like. I, I mean, I like Jamison Williams and Jacoby Myers, but I do like Ramondre. I'm cool yep. with Najee. I actually don't hate this running back range, uh, and I like Dak and Love too. I mean, they would be unstacked, but we can figure out ways to to make that work. We will need wide receivers later. So, do you want to try to get Love here? Yeah, I'm down for that. Let's let's get a little interesting. Let's let's make ourselves a little uncomfortable with love. I would prefer Dak usually as well, but I think trying to play this through love is going to be a little more fun. These poor Kyler. suckers, Dorita, as Dorito says, you guys starved the beast at tight end. That was a hilarious <laughs> tight end run there. Everybody is feeling the pain now when uh, every good tight end just went in the top eighty. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do. We create draft trends here 
and uh, we create a lot of trends here at Spike Week that I end up seeing other places, but that's as far as I'll go with that comment. <laughs> I don't think Colin's going to be back uh, on Wednesday for the show. Why would you oh, no, Colin. love on me? Sorry, sorry, Colin. Uh, I will say, A, apologies, but B, Fuck off. Love, love, but B, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but B, love is one of those guys that, like, I, I'm, the Packers have so many wide receivers and so many, and multiple tight ends. We're not going to be taking the tight ends, but right. like, and frankly, I, I don't think Jordan Love is fun, is, is bad unstacked, which is not something I love that much. No pun intended. Uh, but like, you tell me, dude, seriously. Which one of these Packers wide receivers is like really going to be the guy? I mean, I like, I think this team sets up well for a Dontavian Wicks or something like that. Mm -hmm. But like, dude, if you don't have Dontavian Wicks on your Jordan Love team, I think you're going to be okay. The reason yeah. why we're excited about Jordan Love is Jordan Love and the Packers offense. It's not because any of these guys is like a mega alpha that you have to have at his price at wide receiver. So he, he's a, he's a pretty rare quarterback i think for me where he's not a big runner he can run but he's not a big runner but i also don't feel like you'd like have to you know force any real correlation with him yeah no i agree i actually think this tournament in particular i know the packers are a different situation because i can't imagine they're drafting a wide receiver why would they this year but i think in like as an overall rule of thumb you can kind of talk yourself into any unstacked quarterback because of the draft and just like i'm gonna draft rookie rookie wide receivers to go with this team to yeah to try to hit on one of those stacks i don't i wouldn't say do it every draft but i think you're i think there's a little more leniency in the big board than there is you know the the real tournaments when we start getting to the dk millie and the drafters championship and best ball mania i think you have to be a little more structured in that tournament. I don't know if I'll have unstacked Jordan Love in that one. But to your point, probably sometimes just because of the way that the the Packers get drafted. So I big agree. running back run going on here. Yeah. Everybody uh they were not uh uh interested in what who is the best <laughs> wide receiver of Jacoby Myers being the and I like Jacoby Myers actually, but Jacoby Myers being the best AD Mitchell, Josh Downs uh, and like I said, I, that it's a pretty good. I don't think Tyje should go there anymore, but the hmm. uh, the running back tier right there is is pretty good. It's again a lot of these things are like, why do you like zero running back or hero running back? Is like, we'll draft a couple times, get to this seventh and eighth round, and tell me who you like there. It's like, well, if you like the running backs better in the eighth and ninth round, just don't take the second round. You know, don't take Saquon take Nico Collins. Like you might like Saquon better than Nico Collins, but you also like Ramondre better than Josh Downs. <laughs> you know, you know, you like, you like the running backs better later. We talk about it a lot over the summer. And of course we will again this summer, but like drafting back to front. It's like when you go, like people always draft at the beginning, they start like, who did I take in the first round? That's going to be my stack, right? Who did I take in the second round? That's who I like the best. When really it's like it, when you know who you like in the 10th, 11th and 12th rounds, that can inform your decisions at the beginning of of the draft. And like once you feel it and experience it like we just did, it's like, oh, yeah, that's why I that's why I took the wide receiver in the third round was because we got to the eighth and I hate every wide receiver that's on the board. Yes, we are coming up on our next pick. We are seeing names like Jacoby Myers, Justin Herbert. Uh, so Jacoby Myers goes, uh, I think Zamir is a slam dunk here. Same. I just think Zamir. I'm glad. I'm glad you agree. With the way this, this draft has run out and, smash. you know, to me, it's an absolute smash. I, I just don't know how you don't take Zamir there. Um, no shade on Adam for taking Brian Robinson Jr. Because I do like Brian Robinson Jr. as a player. But to me, those two are close now. No. I, I, I think it's clearly zamir there we could have gone zach moss too i would i would have been fine with that but i i just like the zamir profile a little bit more currently i just updated the rankings earlier today and i have zamir ahead of that whole little uh 
to your right that did he really just release it while we're on the show uh, i guess he was strategically uh planning that we'll talk about that in a second once we get through this pick but i just updated the rankings for anybody that has our best ball almanac which is of course where our rankings are available there's a link to the almanac in the description and i have zamir at 92 mm. so uh just for context it's not like crazy ahead of where he just went but i'm i was also i really like him i'm trying to not like fall in love crazy over aggressive on it yeah so yeah. that that's that's me pumping the brakes a little bit if i if i just went full pedal to the pedal to the floor he'd be higher than 92 but i have him at 92 right now do we want to take troy franklin here yes this is turning out okay for only having three three wide receivers through 10 rounds this is not bad and and <laughs> two quarterbacks and two tight ends already and uh only three wide receivers it's not yeah. this is not bad so let's go through the team and then you can talk about the mobile draft hacker. So we have Kyler and Jordan Love, Jonathan Taylor, Zamir White, Puka, Jalen Waddell, T. Higgins, Troy Franklin, Trey McBride, Kyle Pitts for our team at the moment. That's a good that's a that's a good team. That's a fun team. I'm just double checking uh, to make sure I don't misspeak or anything. So I'm gonna share my screen real quick. If you go to the website, you will see a new item in the header that says Draft Hacker. We just released, uh, for folks that I guess I should, should explain, the Draft Hacker, if you're new to the show, is uh, a tool that we, that we built that will overlay your portfolio information, highlight correlations, show playoff schedules, which of course we don't have the schedules yet, but just about any relevant information, you get to pick it. It's customizable onto your screen while you draft, right? So we can see exposed, right? You have 25% of Brian Robinson Jr. You can see it live on your screen. You can see exposure that you have with combinations of players. And like I said, correlations. So we drafted Trey McBride, uh, uh, Rob uh, needed to sign into the draft hacker or technical difficulties, but uh, I re I reconfigured some stuff on my computer. So I have to re download that draft hacker. It's totally fine. We drafted Trey McBride. When we got to Kyler Murray was showing up in the queue. He would be highlighted in green to say, Hey, dum dum, you have Cardinals. This guy correlates with your Cardinals and yeah. on and on down the list of all those different things that it shows, but it has been desktop only up until this point. There's some, Technology issues, not us. This is not our fault. Uh, mobile tech is always a, a fun experiment, but mm. we just now released a mobile version of the Draft Hacker. So if you go to this page on here, you'll see this is obviously not going to show up well because I'm on desktop. I'm on desktop. It's not on mobile, but you can use the Draft Hacker if you are a premium subscriber on mobile. I've been testing it out. Hackers been using it. It is awesome it is absolutely awesome uh so go check that out if you're already a subscriber go use it right now uh, hop in your draft and go use the mobile hacker the directions uh hacker posted them in the discord and if you're a new subscriber maybe you've been waiting you're like i don't like to draft on desktop dum dum this is a cool tool but i don't like to draft i like to draft on my phone when i'm laying on my couch or on the shitter uh we got you now you can draft while you're using the restroom uh, on your phone. That's the commercial. The draft exactly. It's going to be me <laughs> on the toilet. So look forward to that. Dorito probably drafted his $300,000 winning team on the toilet, <laughs> if I'm betting. Probably did. Uh, we are coming back up on the clock here. I did have Gabe Davis in the queue, and he just went. Do you have interest... In Mike Williams at this price, I do. Bernie kind of Bernie do. Bernie kind of sold me on on Mike Williams. Do you want him to go back to the Chargers? No, no, you do not. No, we, even no. we can't have gone. I don't want to touch the Chargers with a ten foot pole. Yeah, they are. It is a tough situation there. And there he goes. Mike yeah, we do that on purpose. Uh, uh, I like. <laughs> I do like Lad, of course. I like Shahid as yeah. well. I definitely think we want to go wide receiver here. Uh, let's go lad, just because I think I have a decent amount of Shahid already. So fine with me. 
I think I'd rather go Lad on this one, get another rookie, and build out from there. A good question, uh, and I do think we should uh, consider one of these fellas. But Kobukai asks, do we have any love for Khalil Shakir or Curtis Samuel this year? Yeah, I do. Uh, I'm pretty hyped on Curtis Samuel now with the Buffalo Bills. Gabe Davis obviously gone. Curtis Samuel uh, in with the Bills on a decent, decent little contract. I think Curtis Samuel is a good football player. I th- uh, one of my catchphrases of the summer and of the spring so far is he gets on base using the money ball reference. Uh, I believe Curtis Samuel gets on base. And if you can get on base, you know, who doesn't really get on base? Gabe Davis <laughs> doesn't really get on base. And yet he was productive and useful for fantasy. There are different archetypes of players. Trust me. I know. And God, Damn it. The moment we start talking about Dorito uh, already mentioned uh, it in the comments uh, that we weren't getting them. Oh, okay. Got it. Uh, but yes, Dorito, another sharp drafter is on Curtis Samuel. I'm very much on Curtis Samuel. I think I have him in the one twenties of rankings. Yeah. That's someone that I would have definitely considered, but I think, uh, with this next pick, as we wait for dark star desperados to make his pick, I think there's a pretty obvious pick. And I think it's, I think Bingo. we just take Wicks yes. right now. We get Dontavian Wicks. We have our Green Bay Packer. I threw everybody off the scent by not queuing him earlier, <laughs> and we get we get our guy here. I also like to shout out Underdog for putting that negative news blurb in his profile, so that when all the people who you know people, I mean, I click on them sometimes too. Uh, like I don't, it, there's, there's something about that functionality that makes you click it. And then the psychology of the fact that it says he ended his season with a goose egg. You're like, Oh, this guy, this guy stinks, you know, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, like, I do love some of their blurbs. It's like someone saw him dead on the side of the road. It's like, well, <laughs> all right. Thanks underdog. <laughs> oh, geez. He seems a little overpriced at one twenty five. <laughs> Uh, motorcycle season. How come they never gave us a Will Fuller blurb all those times I took <laughs> yeah. him two years ago? Lost on Mount Everest. Yeah. Should have Will been. Fuller. <laughs> Will Fuller only has seven fingers, and he's gone from you know modern society. <laughs> Will Fuller thanks, is just thanks. Roto Wire. Where was the fucking blurb on that one? <laughs> Will Fuller buys a cabin in the middle of Montana, <laughs> never to be seen again. He's the only one living in one of those ghost towns out there. Yeah. Well, just running Will, a general store. <laughs> Will, Will Fuller is uh, uh, Chris Hemsworth from Extraction 2. He's retired and living out in some cabin in the woods. You know, his body is recovering. He can barely walk. But these idiots keep drafting him at pick 130 overall in best just ball. 26, 27% of them that year. No big <laughs> yeah, deal. No big deal. <laughs> you guys just wouldn't get it. You guys just wouldn't get it. As soon as he signs, you don't understand how much <laughs> CLV I'm going to get from this from this Will Fuller. Do you remember Did how you we know? just weren't worried at all? Yeah, it was just like, it's fine. <laughs> it, no one's even heard from him in six months. It's <laughs> fine. It was week three. We're like, yeah, he's definitely going to sign somewhere. He's posted one thing to his Instagram reels in the last three years. Like, the guy is like, gone from modern society seriously <laughs> and we were all spending hundreds if not thousands of dollars on him in fantasy football contests it was absurd i on the dark brings up a good point we need the draft hacker to let us put our own player blurbs <laughs> you shouldn't we should be able we should put our player blurbs on there uh people would people would turn that function off immediately when they saw mine <laughs> what i will say is there is a notes feature Yep. on the draft hacker. I, I don't, I don't use it personally. Um, but I know some people that do, you can add your own notes, uh, using, using the draft hacker. There's a shit ton of stuff. There's stuff that I probably don't even know that you can do because hacker, uh, not the draft hacker, but hacker, our CTO is a freaking wizard and builds all the stuff he is so <laughs> fast. We just had a conversation not that long ago about, yeah, you know, doing the typical project management stuff, like figuring out what priorities are and all that kind of stuff. And we were like, yep, mobile draft hacker, we're in agreement, right? It's the number one priority. He came back from the weekend, like, yeah, I'm almost done with this thing. I'm like, dude, I thought it was going to be like ready by best ball mania season, not by, not by March 17th. (laughs) (laughs) St. Patrick's day special, you know? Yeah, exactly. You you know, (laughs) that's a good, that's a good blurb. 
That's a good word. <laughs> Dorito. Will Fuller lives in a submarine four miles under the surface. Chargers remain interested. <laughs> I only call it bullshit because the Chargers don't want any wide receivers on their team. <laughs> no. no, they do not. They're like, can he can he play running back? <laughs> Is he a left tackle? That's what we want. Uh, oh man. <laughs> we don't want any wide receivers. We're gonna waste this quarterback that we have. <laughs> So we're at a 2 2 6 2 build at the moment. We are clearly done at quarterback and tight end. Um, we're only drafting running backs and wide receivers from this point forward. Is there anyone jumping out at you right now? I have to scroll a little bit. Uh, I'm curious your take on Marvin Mims because he's one I'm struggling to wrap my head around. I have him ranked much lower than this, but I don't. <laughs> I could be convinced, right, that we just say we write off last year. Um, I don't know that he'll make it to us here, but I could be convinced, like I said, that we were excited about him. He basically didn't get on the field last year. Sean Payton's talking about how, I mean, the, the and he goes anyway, so I wasted more breath. But uh, he's, a, he's a peculiar one for sure. Any I don't running hate, back jumping out to you? I don't hate, I mean, I, I do like Kendra. You like Kendra over Braylon? Yeah, I do. I'm not a big Braylon Allen fan. I know that. These are things I do know, but I like to reiterate it just so that we can hit you with cold takes exposed if yes. something pops off. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He <laughs> he is a mutant of a man. He is not a comfortable fade, let's just say, uh, that much. That's why it's nice to, to get the fade out of the way in the big board, and then when the Cowboys draft him in the second round, I, yes. can, feel I can I can only waste all my big board picks and uh, God, know, recon I, reconvene later. Cowboy, he is such a cowboy. Jerry, can you imagine Jerry going to watch Braylon Allen work out? Like, I mean, yeah. uh, he won't need his Viagra for that day to, if he goes and watches uh, uh, Braylon definitely lift be. and run. Definitely going to pull up in his bang bus for sure <laughs> for that one. Oh, I didn't man. report it. ESPN or somebody reported that he had that. <laughs> Not me. Just reiterating facts. Oh, gosh. What are you doing with Roshan now that Swift is there? Anything? I'm still I'm still trying to figure it out, but I my odd man out right now is Herbert. So I'm still fine with Roshan. I just can't imagine... I can't imagine them just shutting down the Roshan experiment because he didn't look bad last year, in my opinion. Only other thing I'd add is I do like Wandale here. Um, if we do want to avoid these running backs and just pile on some late, you know, some late ones. Yeah. Yeah, we can do Wandale. Get our seventh wide receiver. I think, I think based on the way we drafted, this turned out, this is turning out. Like almost perfect for this team, so can't wait for it to finish twelfth. But yeah, the team as as constructed is Kyler Murray, Jordan Love, Jonathan Taylor, Zamir White, Kendra Miller, Puka, Jalen Waddle, T. Higgins, Troy Franklin, Lad McConkey, Dontavian Wicks, Wandale Robinson, Trey McBride, Kyle Pitts. The, I mean, this is real nice. This is the way that I like to set up my teams. I do think we have a tendency to go overboard with rookies sometimes. So I like to sprinkle like two to four in on a draft like this, like maybe get a couple of rookie running backs too, but have enough mid year, like, like veterans, but not like old veterans. Right. right. Like, you know <clears throat> what I mean? So this team to me is nailing that for sure. And, and we're able to punt, running back because even though we got Zamir at pick 105 I mean Zamir seems like a slam dunk right now to go with Jonathan Taylor it just it feels great the team feels really good Zamir is a good fit on all teams right now but especially yeah. a team like this where yeah. we know we're going to be throwing on like you know our last four or five running backs are all going to be like scratch off lottery tickets you have Jonathan Taylor as your anchor and then you bring in Zamir as like we're counting on those two guys, which is really difficult to say from a 10th round pick or whatever Samir White is. You don't get that opportunity very often. And then obviously if it's zero running back teams where, <clears throat> you know, you're definitely going to have a lot of scratch off lottery tickets and you need some kind of juice. He's just a, I actually think he's a worse fit on like the, you know, if you're drafting multiple early running backs, because it's yeah. like his power is that 
if it works out how we're thinking it's going to work out, you're getting early round production from this running back. And so you would rather have the 2v2 again of give me the superstar wide receiver with Samir versus, you know, the I, I'm I, I, my fourth running back is Samir White. It's like you're kind of you're kind of cutting off his value, the the impact that he brings to the team. Unless, and this is where you can start doing all these different builds, unless it's a hyper fragile. I think that's the only way you can do it is him as your fourth. Yeah, yeah. If you only draft four, yeah, get real yeah. funky. You know, do do what we did at quarterback and tight end. Yeah, uh, and only draft four running backs, and then twelve wide receiver time, baby. Just pile yeah. on all the rookies and all the you know the upside bets or whatever at wide receiver. Pray to find. We know that there's not going to be a Puka, right? But pray to find. You don't have to find Puka. Find Zay Flowers or find you know Rashi Rice. Like it can be like it not. We always do that, and I get it because we people get sometimes a little triggered when we use the examples from the like they are the outliers but we're just trying to use the examples of this is what can technically happen right, right. because it just did we don't actually mean the next guy's going to be Kyron williams or puka Nakua, but it could be rushy rice it could be mm -hmm. say flowers sure like, it could be those guys it could be sam laporta would you like sam laporta in the last round on your team like i i would like yeah. it could be those guys too you know what i mean it doesn't yeah. have to be Kyron, but if you if you loaded up early running backs and you found rice and say flowers and those guys like you drafted an awesome uh, uh jaden reed right jaden reed if you mm -hmm. drafted those guys on a, a big board team last year you were smashing yeah tank downs there's tons of them hyper fragile is not my favorite build but i will do it that being said like it, it is a build that i will uh dabble in sometimes I think you should be and dabbling I, in all builds at some point. I think it's, I think it that's to our very beginning conversation. It's possible there'll be some potential edges with some hyper fragile stuff. If you do it smartly, like I don't think you want to do like four RBs in a row to start your draft, of course. But I think the whole world is now like hyper fragile one, best ball mania one, right? With Herzig. And so, it, like, as we do, the whole industry was like, oh, hyper fragile. This thing can work because Herzig won with it. And then it that that has been a disastrous structure <laughs> to use for the last two years. So now, but now like nobody's doing it. And the but the running backs are yeah. right. That those first two round running backs are pretty damn good. You know, mm -hmm. you get Bijan and JT or Bijan and Saquon or something like that, then double back and get, you know, Zamir and and a rookie, Zamir and Jonathan Brooks, or Zamir and Trey Benson or whatever. I'm just, you know, Zamir and Chuba. I don't give a shit. Pick your flavor in those ranges. You hit on those four guys that can win. Of course that mm -hmm. can win. And I think no, we're going to go back to nobody's doing that again. When for the last couple of years, it's been like, people are doing this way too much. Agreed. We have a two, three, seven, two build in the 15th round. We're looking at like Ray Davis, Rico Dottle, Estime. I'm not buying this Rico Dottle steam i'll tell you that much um i like I'm, ray davis let's do ray davis all right the the rico dowdle thing i know he just re-signed <clears throat> with uh with dallas <laughs> i i understand he's technically on the dallas cowboys right now and i understand that he's technically at the top of the depth chart the odds that he is the guy in dallas are basically zero and the odds, even that he's the backup, are not some certainty. This guy didn't exactly cement himself last year <laughs> as a quality NFL running back. He's a he's a late free agency signing. He signed for one year, one point two million dollars. They can cut him. Hmm. He's not even a lock to make the roster. Like they could like <clears throat> teams bring in backs all the time. Dallas is probably for sure drafting someone, and they're not out of the free agent running back game. They could be waiting out some of these veterans. I think. The steam on him. Now, if you drafted him in the last round for a bunch, I think it was fine to make that bet. But I think buying him as he rises is really not a bet that I would want to be making. I would want to be looking for the actual Dallas Cowboys running back or running backs uh, and betting on these guys who are not on teams right now. You want to take Will Shipley here? Yeah, that's fine. I, I'm not a big fan of him, but I think it's a bias towards white running backs. <laughs> Um, I'm going to, I'm going to expand on that a little bit. And I think it actually just goes along with our conversation earlier. I have no ill will towards Rico Dowdle. And if you no. want to draft him here, it's fine. We drafted him last year. We yeah. were drafting him last year. Yeah. 
um, towards the end because I was drafting the other dude that couldn't <laughs> find the field. Malik. But we have Malik. Um, but we just had this conversation about understanding what's going to happen with the team and reading the tea leaves. You brought it all up. They are definitely bringing somebody in. And that doesn't mean that Rico Dowdle has no value, right? But to your point, he's starting to steam up. And once they draft somebody or sign somebody, he's going to drop immediately, right? So he is one of the prime guys to drop back down. So I don't need to take Rico Dowdle in the 15th round right now because I know he's going to drop back to the 17th, 18th round. It's just mm-hmm. It's just the way drafters are. Doesn't matter who it is. Once they draft somebody, once they sign somebody, that lowers Rico's value in everyone's mind. And that might be wrong. He might be fine in the 15th round. He might pay off dividends still, even with them bringing somebody in. But I think at this point, I'd rather take some shots other other places when I know he's going to drop, right? And and because and – and you and I, you know, we'll talk about this too over the course of the summer – the difference between the 15th, 16th, 17th is not, doesn't matter. not really. Too much. Uh, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But also it's just like, again, the, the market is this, the Rico Dowdle thing is just kind of crazy to me. Like deciding he is the backup that we like all want here in these later rounds when like <clears throat> there are rookies here who have a chance to be the starting running back. They could be the, st- there are rookies here who have a chance to be the starting running back on the Cowboys ahead of Rico Dowdle that, that go, you know, in this range. And so it's kind of a, just a personal, like, I'm not hating on anybody that's drafting Rico Dowdle, but like, I, I want more. Like, I want to swing for more. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I can get those, I can get the bet on a backup running back later. And I do. Right. Ronnie Rivers. I have a bunch of Ronnie Rivers. Right. We've been drafting Emmanuel Wilson, but hoping that he was the backup for the, the Packers. I have some Evan Hall, but that's like I'm taking my 20th round swings mm-hmm. on those guys. I don't want to take that guy that's been going in the 20th and continues to rise into the 15th and into the 14th, which he will, by the way. He's going to keep rising into the 15th, into the 14th, into the 13th. You know, I don't want to take that guy when there are other bets and his ceiling case, in my opinion. And I'll wave my white flag. I'll hold my L if he's the starting Cowboys running back. I happily will. But in my opinion, the ceiling case for him is at best the Cowboys backup running back. At at best. It, at worst, he's not on the Cowboys. He's on the unemployment line. Like that, that's the possible thing that we're talking about here. Uh, and so I like I don't know. I, it, I'm a little kinda... more I'm a little more bullish than you on him, like like in his range of outcomes. But what I'll say on it is this is very tournament specific for me Mm -hmm. because I want to take those shots that you just said, because there's more uncertainty in, in back end now than there will be in three months. So now is when to take, I mean, you're going to want to take chances throughout the entire summer, Yeah. but now there's so much uncertainty. We don't know where we just drafted a guy. We don't know where he's going to play. We don't know where Will Shipley's getting drafted. Like by any means, (laughs) you know what I mean? So like it's, but in three months, if Will Shipley's in this spot, we know which team he's on. We know what his likely range of production is going to be. Granted, everyone's healthy. So I, I just I want to dip into the uncertainty a little bit more. And if this was in BBM, I'd tell you to take Rico Dotto all day. Yeah, okay. it's different. It's a different game. It's a that, that that's part of what I was saying. It's like yeah. the guys that go here have real upside in their range of outcomes and he doesn't in in my opinion and we'll make this pick and then there's a good uh question that i want to uh hit on that i think maybe more so hammers it hammers at home gotcha all right so we're two picks away we're looking at here are the top three tight ends right now oh my god darren waller just <laughs> went off the board oh he was <laughs> retired <laughs> this is Tyler. like when uh, uh the there was a uh a team that uh threw the discord into a, a tizzy when, uh, oh my gosh, who's the quarterback that uh, Dwayne Haskins got drafted in a best ball mania team last year. Uh, RIP actual RIP, not retired RIP. Um, anyone you're looking at here? Do we want to look at wide receiver? Malik. Do you want to take Trey Palmer? Malik. Do you want to take Malik Washington here? Yes. Let's do it. So super quickly uh, before we come back on the clock, because 
Uh, question is, why can Rico Dowdle not be the Dallas Cowboys Kyron from last year? Well, because Kyron's actually good and Rico Dowdle is bad. And so I, I understand Kyron like came out of nowhere to like most people and stuff, but like Kyron was an early declare running back from Notre Dame who was insanely productive, like insanely productive at Notre Dame. He just ran slow. He's not a great athlete, right? He's like a Devin Singletary. Shocker, those guys continue to do well because they're just good at football, even though they run slow in the 40. Kyron Williams is a good pass catcher. Kyron Williams is a good pass protector. And Kyron Williams was a, a level of unknown because he hadn't really played. Also, we got indications that Kyron Williams was in a timeshare with Cam Akers before the season started. Um, Rico Dowdle never ran for more than 764 yards at South Carolina. Rico Dowdle's 25. He's been in the NFL. He's been on the Cowboys. If we would have seen something, we would have seen it by now. So um, that's part of the, the take here. Any of these running backs? Do we, do we like Dylan Lobb here? Do we like someone else? Uh, Lob, yeah, we can do Dylan Lobb. I'm trying to get a little more of him just because I don't really love him. But what do you think about Rondale on the Falcons now? I'm not saying we have to take him, but uh, uh, he, he any, does any, nothing any? for me, to be well, honest. Then, what about Greg Dortch now that uh, I know H Hackers? Hackers trying to sell me on Greg Dortch because Rondale is gone. And I, mean, I really was... liked his touchdown celebration last year. That was yes, a hundred percent. I mean, but I but I don't think we're going to see it that much this year. No. <laughs> Those two times he does it all year will be really fun, though. It'll be a lot of fun. That probably random a, game in October, punt, probably on a punt return. <laughs> yeah, some fumble recovery from Kyler in the end zone or something. But yeah, I mean, I like Dorch, but I. Eh. This. I'll have him. I'll have him is what I'll say. This. I forgot about this because I brought this up the other day or no, other people have brought this up too. So Dorito just took, he says, somewhat jokingly, but not entirely jokingly. I just drafted the Cowboys starter. And who he selected in the 18th round is Ezekiel Elliott. Like I can, can you not, we talked about Braylon Allen, like being able to see Jerry Jones drafting Braylon Allen. Can you not see Jerry Jones being like, I'm going to draft Jonathan Brooks. Right. And he's coming off the ACL and I'm just going to go get me Zeke and I'm going to pair those two up in this in this backfield. Like he's probably missing. Zeke. Like, did you see how bad Pollard and Dowdle were last year? And Zeke was actually kind of good for the Patriots. He was probably like, mother. I can't believe I let this dude <laughs> walk. He's a free agent. Let's. They're probably just negotiating. You know how many chicken wings Zeke wants in his contract or whatever, you know, or how big the bowl of cereal is that he gets every morning. Uh, I, I could I could totally see. Zeke coming back. They're definitely drafting a guy, but I, I, Zeke would not be shocking to me at all in the Cowboys. I wouldn't be shocked either, to be perfectly honest. Definitely wouldn't be shocked on that one. All right. This is super gross town. Gross gross time is what I was going to say. Gross town works too. This is gross town. Daniel Jones. Traylon Burks, man. What a career. What a... <laughs> What a career. What a run out for Traylon Burks. Oh, man. Is he even going to play? I, I, I think that Tennessee team is going to be a disaster. I could be it's wrong. Gonna be a, I, it, I no, they're going to be the commander's level disaster where it's going to be gross, but like it's gross when you pass by a car wreck too, but you still don't stop watching it when you when you drive by. Oh, you dude, know what I, I mean? I saw a crazy car accident yesterday. Um, and you probably looked. You see, well, it was, it was gross, but you just the, looked at it. The pickup truck was coming towards me, and they hit a downed electrical line and barrel rolled twice and landed on their wheels. Like, literally barrel lo rolled twice. What? In insanity. You watched this actually happen in your – you were in your car. Yeah, I was. I went and picked up food, and as I was driving back, I, everyone came running out of their houses screaming, calling the cops. I had to do like a – you turn and go the other way. Well, yeah, because your food couldn't get cold. I, it was macaroni and cheese with buffalo chicken. You can't allow <laughs> no macaroni and cheese to get cold. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Somebody else gonna have to get you to the hospital. But uh, this mac and cheese, you know. I, I stopped. Weird. I stopped, and I was like, "What can I do to help this situation?" And the answer was nothing, because there was already three people dry, running down the road calling nine one one. So, right. You can't do anything. And the only thing yeah. that happens is that guy dies and your mac and cheese get cold. 
Right. And then it's like a total lose lose. At least let somebody win in this whole situation. I should have walked up to the truck while eating it. Like yeah, everybody. exactly. That's right? what, see, that was that was the win win. <laughs> You're running with the mac and cheese in in everybody's running and calling on the phone, and Rob's just running up to the car with mac and cheese and chicken in his hands. <laughs> Gotham's in the car, like, why the fuck is he eating the mac and cheese there <laughs> and not at home where I can maybe get some bread? <laughs> right. Oh man, gosh. But yeah, it was insane. That's crazy insane moment in my life that i was just like i cannot believe this is happening yeah olaf says sickos yeah i have a uh, somewhat of a dark sense of humor and if we can't laugh at things it's like a, i think bill burr or somebody like that says it's like, yeah. everything is a joke or just, i might have been seinfeld it's like everything is a joke if you get offended by a joke is like you just really don't like humor that much it's just like everything is a joke it's life it happens what are mm -hmm. you gonna do I mean, I have to talk about ghosts every week and situations that happen around there. So I have to joke about that stuff because otherwise yeah. you just lose your mind. Yeah, exactly. So. If we don't laugh, we'll cry. Welcome to America 2024. Somebody should run on that that uh, as a slogan. If you don't, <laughs> that should laugh, just be cry. our that should be our slogan for drafts. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Draft IQ. If you don't laugh, you'll <laughs> cry. Anyone standing out here for you? God, no. Um, we do need to take a running back, though. Do you want to take Justice any... Hill? No. Do you want to take Emmanuel Wilson? Let's at least take a let's take a rookie. Take Isaiah Davis or some. Let's take a rookie if we're gonna. Let's All take right. a swing because we're you know we we have <clears throat> JT and Zamir. Right. Let's just take some some swings. Well, I think Adolph. Justice Hill could still have some pop. No. I don't he didn't love do him. it last year. He didn't do it. He got the chance last year. He started to carve out a role. I think, I think he's like an, he's an NFL running back, but like his chance of winning us anything in best ball. Yeah. I guess on this team too, he wouldn't make as much sense. Yeah. If we're assessing hacker must've just caught the Dorch part of the conversation. He's in there. Couldn't help, but Dorch season in the. <laughs> Um, would so you, gotta, yeah, would you take another running back or a wide receiver here? Eight eight two eight eight two or two seven nine two on this? Probably wide receiver. I think we could do another wide receiver. I think either is fine, to be honest. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, but I think we could do either and be fine. But we can. Uh, I'm fine with a receiver here. God, rest in peace to Jonathan Mingo. Yes. Uh, let's scroll a little bit at wide receiver and see. Oh, I like Calvin Austin a bit this late second year. Deontay's gone. Oh, gosh, I don't. I mean, I don't love him, but I like him as a. I'm fine, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. We didn't even talk through that. I lost him. Where would he go? There he is. Yeah, well, he is little, so it's pretty fitting that you couldn't see him. Yeah, luckily there's three of them though. Yeah, <laughs> that's there needs to be three to make up one normal sized human. It's just three Calvin Austins in the trench coat on the field. Yeah, uh, I guess it is technically his uh, uh, third third year. I think well, he was hurt, right? Um, his rookie year, I think. But year, yeah. he he is he's definitely one that I'm probably not not going to be drafting. But it I can un I can understand it. I was kind of excited for him last year. I was like, dude, his only path. Uh, or his only the only thing in his path to getting on the field for the Steelers was Allen Robinson, and he did start to <clears throat> get on the field a little bit. He started to get on the field. He scored a long touchdown. It was on a showdown slate too. I remember because uh, 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 it was a Sunday night football, I believe, showdown slate, and uh, on we have the serious show on Sundays before and during Sunday night football. So we break down the showdown slate. And uh, that was one of the biggest celebrations I've ever had in my life uh, was uh, celebrating a Calvin Austin touchdown. But <clears throat> I, I think that there's like some potential usability in there if, if you know, and I, I do think as much shade as we give Arthur Smith, he could be a guy that could like unlock some, some big plays to, to a Calvin Austin. You know, he does do some of that weird stuff, right? How many times did we see these scrubs, Scotty Miller and Mac Hollins and all these guys scoring points? I just don't think there's a real path to him ever being, you know, anything that we're 
about from a week to week basis, but he could, you know, could he have a couple of games where he pops off for 18 points because of a long touchdown? I don't think that that's out of the question. I think it's totally viable with Russ as his quarterback too. And if fields, it, fields and will chuck that thing. Fields downfield. will chuck it downfield too. So I think 20th round, I don't know if we'll get to him in BBM, no. but 20th round in this. Sure. Why not take a shot here or there? A couple teams with him. Speaking of teams, our team is Kyler Murray, Jordan Love at quarterback, Jonathan Taylor, Zamir White, Kendra Miller, Ray Davis, Will Shipley, Dylan Lobb, Isaiah Davis. So it went real rookie heavy, but I think it's okay because of our starting two running backs here. It allows us to uh, wish upon a rookie star. Wide receivers are Puka, Jalen Waddle, T. Higgins, Troy Franklin, Lad McConkey, Dontavian Wicks, Wandale Robinson, Malik Washington, Calvin Austin, and Trey McBride, Kyle Pitts. Pretty fun team. Yeah, this was a fun, fun. This was this was a fun draft. A little uh unique, I would say, in terms of structure, the combination of players is kind of fun. You know, like you said, a bu- just piling on a bunch of rookies to a JT Zamir mm-hmm. start at running back, double elite tight end is something that I don't think a lot of people do. Starve the beast at tight end, uh, as the folks say. And um, yeah, I, I do think <clears throat> just a my kind of final bow on it all the double kind of early ish quarterback and the double elite tight end is not something that I expect I'll be doing in best ball mania season, but I think in the big board, it affords us because of the fact that we know that the market is just going to be inefficient. There are going to be rookies and, and second year and third year players that hit from later in the draft. It does allow you to, to play around with some of those things a little bit more. Whereas like you've mentioned, we'll adjust uh, you know during BBM season where the market like knows we know the landing spots. So generally that that 17th round wide receiver is a late round pick for a reason here. There's going to be tank Dells and Puka Nakua's and Josh Downs's and Zay flowers and stuff that are going late. And we just don't foresee it. You know, we just don't know Malik Washington, you know, is my favorite one of that, but pick your flavor of rookie. When you hit on those guys, it helped. You can offset, you know, the value loss of the two elite quarterbacks or two elite tight ends. Yeah, totally agree. Well, we ran quite long on this one, so I am just going to say that it is time to get out of here. Hope you guys enjoyed the draft. Get the draft hacker. Go do our college basketball madness challenge. If you win this, if you win the Spike Week March Madness Challenge, if your bracket is number one, you get Spike Week free for life. Very NWO of us, which makes quite perfect sense that we are going to do something for like can you imagine getting a service for life for free like and it's a draft hacker something that allows you to win more money throughout <laughs> the rest of your life if you're old like me that might only be like five years for you <laughs> but if you're young like bullock that's like 500 more years of the <laughs> draft hacker like go go enter this draft i want to and I'm going to enter it. And when I enter it, everyone, if I win, you all have to pay double for the rest there of your lives. That's I like the, that. the trade-off, right? Perfectly said. That's the show. See you guys Wednesday. Peace. One. Woo! Those were some spicy takes. Want to stay up to date with all of the other spicy takes we're going to have over here at Spike Week? Why don't you press that subscribe button below? You turn notifications on, we draft a team, boom, you know about it. We have another spicy take, boom, you know about it. You can be there. You can draft with us. You want to stay up to date? That's how you do it. All right, we'll catch you later next time here at Spike Week.